So, rules for the show. It's going to be it's going to be an extremely interesting show tonight. The rules are as follows: no bad language, one call per show. Very simple. Almost no rules. I'm going to assume that you all have had enough politics for the night. So I'm not going to do that to you. I did see the debates, and that's all I have to say. In Chile, though, they've got some serious news to deal with. That's a big earthquake, 8.3. 8.3 off Chile's northern uh, coast on Wednesday night, causing buildings to sway in the capital, Santiago, causing tsunami warnings and, in fact, really big heavy waves, some flooding. Big earthquake, 8.3. I wonder when the big one comes to us. It is interesting to me that we have spent, I don't know how many billions of dollars, training Syrian rebels to fight, right? We want them to uh, to fight. And uh, we are left with, well, we did have 54 fighters, and that was pretty embarrassing. Now, now we're down to four or five fighting soldiers. That's just nuts. Uh, in other words, it didn't work, period. There is an interesting survey going on. Well, maybe it's interesting. It's uh, Tara McIsaac, I believe it is, reporting on Rupert Sheldrakes. He's always doing a study on something, plants or something, right? He's a very interesting interview. We should have him on, Rupert Sheldrake. But now he's doing a survey on how many of you are telepathic with regard to your phone? In other words, when your phone rings, do you know who's calling? I, I'm not sure that, you know, a positive result on this is going to prove anything at all with regard to um, a telepathy. I, I just I don't think it's going to. Uh, but uh, we'll see. And I'd, I'd like to have Rupert on. Anyway, again, I'm not wild about this particular survey because, you know, I usually know who's calling, right? Boy, I'll tell you what. Buy a car and let the warranty lapse. You want calls? They will call you to death. Absolutely call you to death. It's crazy what they do. (laughs) They never stop. Your warranty, your warranty. You've got to do it. No, I don't. I don't have to do it. You know, I can take my chances. If I have my own money, I can take my chances. Oh, you don't want to do that. You want to pay us. No, actually, I don't. I'd rather take my chances. Thank you. If I have to pay to get it fixed, I'll pay to have it fixed. All right. Well, anyway, coming up tonight, we're going to be talking uh, with David Weatherly. And the subject is going to be shadow people. Now, because of the um, urgent attempt to get the Internet uh, functioning again, I didn't have an opportunity to get uh, hold of our guest yet. So I'm going to do the break first, and I'm going to get him on the line because, and it's a big because, uh, I want him to hear my story of terror. And I'm not, uh, I'm not kidding about that word terror really is the right word and that's the only decent word for the only word that fits i had a terror i've been a talk show host i've been talking about this kind of stuff all my adult life but it never happens to me save an experience with um, uh, a couple of unidentified flying objects one very serious one None of this other stuff, I've never met these creatures, these animals, these things that we talk about and wonder about on the air. Until. (laughs) And I'm telling this mostly for uh, David's benefit, because I doubt he's ever heard it. Until about two weeks or three weeks, two or three weeks before the show, I was um, staying up late, getting in training. You have no idea the hours I keep. 
It's awful, actually. I rarely get to sleep anymore before about 5 to 6 in the morning, usually about 6. At any rate, I was in training for that later hour. Turned out I needed more training, by the way. Um, and I was in my ham shack, my ham radio room. You've seen pictures. In fact, there's a picture of that on my profile picture on Facebook. And uh, working on the computer. I've got a, you know, a full desktop computer and a monitor in there. And I was beginning to catch up on the world of the paranormal, because that's about, you know, what I was up to plunge into again, working very late into the morning, uh, concentrating very hard. And so what I'm going to tell you is the dead flat truth, and it is terrifying. It may not sound terrifying to you because it, it, you know, it hasn't happened to you yet. Or maybe it has. I, you you know how we've talked in earlier programs about how you can sense when somebody's watching you or you're being watched or something? Um, I had that sense. And oh God, I turned to my right and here is this human form. It was not completely solid. I could see something behind it, but it did have enough solidity so I knew what I was looking at. This wasn't, you know, a trick of the eye. This wasn't a floater in the eye or anything like that. A lot of people, I guess, have that kind of problem. Uh, I don't see how you could mistake it for what I saw because what I saw was a being. It was a being. It, it looked like a human. Now, it had legs, it had a torso, it had a head. The arms, I guess, were at the side and kind of mixed in with it, but other than that, that's what it looked like. And as I mentioned, I could see through it. Now, this doesn't... I'm describing this to you, but it doesn't describe the instant of terror. This was to my right, as I sat on the desk. I looked over and I saw this being, and I just kind of jumped, and I guess I was on a little bit of shock, um, or a lot of shock, I don't know. Anyway, it vanished, it was gone, and I looked behind me, you know, I just swivel, I've got a swivel chair. All my chairs are made for a bad back, right? I've got a swivel chair. I swiveled around, looked behind me, and there it was. It was behind me, up against the back wall. And I could, again, uh, see a little bit behind it, but it was pretty solid. Still looking just the same way, no real change. The same way. And I was scared out of my wits. I I came back around, and oh my God, it was on my left. It was on my left, up against the wall. And when it disappeared, it just went like that. It was just gone. And then suddenly it was to my left, up against the wall. I don't know any other words to describe it except shadow person or shadow being or entity, uh, whatever in the hell it was. It scared me so badly at that point that I ran out of the room. You know, I've got a wife. I've got a daughter in a room next to me, uh, next to my ham shack. I ran to the back of the house to the closet. Uh, I I guess I really shouldn't be talking about all of this. Anyway, I, I went to where I keep a weapon and... Got it. Probably a poor choice, but I, I'll tell you, um, the terror was such that I was convinced that we had an intruder in the house, that we had, that something awful was there, whatever in the hell it was, it was awful. And so I went everywhere. I went everywhere in the house. I went in every room. I went out in the garage. I went all over the place. Surprised I didn't wake my wife. And found nothing. But when I tell you what I experienced was terror, I mean real terror. No idea what I saw to this very day. No idea. I remember doing a show many, many years ago on shadow people. People sent in pictures of, you know, shadow beings in hats and stuff like that. But, you know, to me, at that point, it's something that we talk about. It's something for a night's subject, 
and it kind of snuck up on me slowly. I had never heard of it before and certainly never experienced it until recently. So there you have my kind of embarrassing description of, uh, of what happened. Now comes David Weatherly, thank goodness, a paranormal investigator, an author, adventurer, explorer for over 35 years. He has delved into the world of the strange, investigating cases around the country and around the world. He has written and lectured on a diverse range of topics, including cryptozoology, ufology, hauntings, and ancient mysteries. David has also studied shamanic and magic, uh, magical traditions with elders from numerous cultures, including Europe, Tibet, Native American, and Africa. He has been a guest on a wide range of TV and radio programs, including Dreamland, over there with Whitley, featured in Watchers Volume 5. He is the author of Black-Eyed Children. Oh, that's another good one. Uh, that has only come up recently, and a book called Strange Intruders. So, David, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. Good evening, Art. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Yeah, good evening. So, you know, I had to delay things and change them around so that I had you on the line when I went through that description. And um, I wanted you to hear what I experienced, which, honestly, it scared the hell out of me, David. It really did. It um, It's hard to describe the kind of terror that I felt. Oh, no doubt, Art. And I tell you, over the years, I have sat down with so many people and heard, you know, countless variations of that same type of account. And, you know, often when I interview these people, uh, it's like interviewing someone who's just went through a trauma. Oh, yeah. Or, a you trauma. know, a very yeah. frightening experience, and they, and they just radiate. Uh, you know, I, I find that a lot of these people, even recounting their experiences to me, if it's been, you know, a, a year or several years sometimes, when they go back to that moment, they they yeah. start becoming fearful again. That's right. It comes right back. Because it comes of back. Calling the experience. It's yes. Just, it, it brings back not just the memory, but the emotional state that That's occurs. Right. That's right. The terror. These encounters. <laughs> That's the, the word terror. for it. There's, terror. There's no Trust me. Terror. Yeah. There's 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 no other word for it. And and I'll tell you, I've heard some you know that were were so frightening and and over the top that. You know, you really sort of wonder how some of these people even maintain their uh, <laughs> sanity long enough to push beyond this. Uh, because there are some of these encounters that become physical. And uh, yeah. that takes the fear factor up in many more levels. Yeah, you sure would. Um, I, I swear, if yeah, it was a terrible idea to get a gun. Because if I had seen this thing, I'd have fired I, I don't, and it wouldn't have done a damn bit of good. Now that I think back on it, I'm sure it wouldn't. I mean, I'm sure a bullet would go through it just like a little bit of the oh, light sure. did. I, I, you know, I guess you're some kind of expert on these things. Well, what the hell are they? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, despite having you know so many years in the paranormal, I, I don't know that there's any such thing as an expert in this field. I, you know, I, I I continue to investigate, and all I have are more questions. And the shadow people, man, that's right there at the top of things that we really we just don't have enough answers. And one of the reasons that we don't is because these shadow beings, first of all, they go way back in history. You know, you can read early oh, medieval accounts of people encountering uh, shadow or phantom monks, as they used to call them. And it would be this black, moving shadow, for lack of a better term. Mine didn't move. Was, I mean, it moved from one wearing, part of the room to the other. Uh, that's right. But not there was no physical movement of legs or anything like that. No, but, you know, they almost move like shadows. You know, just as if you, you know, if, if the way a shadow can suddenly move from one wall to other to another, of you course, put your hand in front of a light and project yes. a shadow, and that that jerky sudden movement, where it looks like you know it's is in one location and suddenly it's in another, right? And uh, this is very common with these things. You know, people will report these things. They're very commonly reported in people's bedrooms. 
late at night. And people will see these things at the foot of the bed or across the room, you know, just looking uh-huh. in their direction. All right. And let me see if I can suddenly get, get it moves. Yeah, let me see if I can get you to understand this. I'm I'm a pretty rational person. I'm actually kind of a skeptic with most things. Frankly, I am. But I'm telling you, David, uh, this thing had form. It was real. It was not some trick of shadow. It was not some trick of uh, something whispering across my eye. It was real on my right. It was real. It was uh, real behind me. It was real on my left. This was a real something. And and you know I can say these words and people will sit out there and go, yeah right. He saw something. No, I saw a shadow person or what I would describe as a shadow person and. There's absolutely no question about it. If people want to doubt it, fine, doubt it away. This thing was real, uh, a real something, and it was terrifying. Now that I've got that off my mind, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> well, I, I absolutely <sighs> believe you, Art. And, you know, as I said, I, I've spoken to so many people who were really in the same position that you are. Uh, you know, they, they weren't interested necessarily in anything you know, paranormal or, or strange, and, you know, these weren't common topics for them to sit and discuss, but suddenly, you know, things, something like this happens, and, you know, in a heartbeat, it takes someone from being a skeptic to suddenly mm-hmm. realizing, my God, I have experienced something that there is is no rational explanation for. Yeah. And it's it, it, that alone, <laughs> you know, really transforms someone emotionally and mentally and and every other way but you know moving beyond the fear of the experience is often what proves to be the most difficult thing for people who have these encounters because it is a physical reality and you know just like you pointed out there's plenty of people who who will jump up and down and say no no this is uh you know, this is a result of uh, exhaustion or stress or, you know, it's a trick of the mind and all these various things. But I have one there. theory, David. Can I run it by you? It's, sure. It's, on, it's only a theory. Um, it seems to me that if you sit in front of a monitor uh, for enough hours, and I had been there for a long time, that uh, your brain begins to be affected by the refresh rate of that monitor, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm, I've, I've always kind of wondered, would that allow you to see something that you would otherwise not see? That's the best I can do, because I was sitting in front of the computer for a long time before this, and so there's one theory. And And that's a great theory. And one of the things that we can sort of connect that to is that, you know, through the ages, tribal cultures use things to alter their consciousness. And I, I'm not talking about hallucinations or drugs or anything like that, but they use things that are repetitive, uh, such as drumming, trance dancing. Mm-hmm. Um, things like this, Very good according point. to tribal beliefs, raise the awareness and alter the consciousness, which allows you to see things that exist at a different vibratory level. That's that's the easiest way I can explain it in, in sort of uh, simple terms. And, you know, a lot of people, again, will, will doubt things like this, but when we huh. look at modern science, quantum science is now saying, hey, we've figured out that there are 12 other dimensions of it, of, you know, 12, 12 other dimensions. We don't know how to get there or what's there but we know they're there. Well, (laughs) you know, this was uh, a grand announcement a few years ago by a group of quantum scientists, and I had to kind of chuckle when I read it because I thought, you know, shaman around the world have been talking about this for ages and saying the same thing. You know, it's just that it's framed within their uh, spiritual, magical traditions, but they say the same thing. They say, hey, there are other levels of existence other levels of reality that exist around ours and intermingle with ours. We just don't have the level of awareness to understand 
what's there and possibly interacting with us. David, what brought you to this field to investigate this kind of thing, shadow people specifically? It just sort of blended in with, you know, my interest in a wide range of strange topics. And, and shadow people just run consistently through almost everything. I mean, all right, a few years ago, they did a poll about, uh, you know, paranormal and supernatural topics. And they found that shadow people are one of the most widely reported phenomena worldwide, worldwide. And you find these mm-hmm. things in conjunction with... Oh, haunted sites. Um, yeah, but I don't live in a haunted site. everywhere. Um, nothing haunted about where I live that I know of. I've never had any other haunted-like things happen before. Uh, no rattling of chains in the midst of the night, you know, <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> so, you know, a lot of years behind me without anything like this having happened, um I, you know, I've been racking my brain for what brought it on, why, the rest of it, what what it could have been. And um, I guess you're right. I guess these people or these, what what would you call them? I call them entities. Oh. You know, I, I don't know exactly what they are. They they always, they mostly appear in human form. Uh, occasionally, you'll hear reports of them being very small in stature, you know, almost childlike in size. The first thought that crossed uh, Stephen Painter's five-year-old mind was that someone had broken into the house in Bury, Great Manchester, England, around 1986. My mom took me to the local uh, estate to her friend's house, Painter said. I believe that she had been burgled because her kitchen, her entire kitchen, was covered, and I mean covered, in black handprints, almost animal-like. He didn't say anything about the obvious black handprints, not until later. I mentioned the incident to my mother, what I saw. She looked at me and said, Nothing, nothing on the wall, Stephen. He didn't know how that could be. The prints were there. His mother's friend said she saw shadows in the image of dark faces on the walls. His mother was immune. There was nothing on the wall, from her point of view. From that point, dark images have followed Painter. The animal-like prints he saw when he was five have turned into entities. I've seen a big black mass with red eyes, good Lord, always at the door, he said. The hat man, always in the background and typical shadow people just like our shadows on a sunny day. And and you know what? Uh, they are like shadows on a sunny day, but of more substance. I only relate to you what I saw of more substance than that. Um, welcome back, David. A little story there. Uh, when shadow people attack. So that's like the next thing I want to get to. I always thought that they were just sort of, uh, what's the right word? Um I don't know, beings, if you will, or whatever they are, that they didn't physically attack people, that takes it to like a whole new level. It really does. And I tell you, Art, you know, um, all the years of interviewing people and so forth, one of the weirdest and most frightening accounts I've heard was from a gentleman who had a physical encounter with a shadow being. And uh, this fellow, his name was John, he um, he considered himself a religious person, but he had stopped going to church. He was, you know, very focused on his career. He started to notice some strange things in his home. He lived alone. Uh, he started seeing fleeting movement out of his peripheral vision. Odd things started to happen, you know, like a fork would go flying off the table. Hmm. Little things around the home. And he continued to try to dismiss it until he started seeing these shadow beings directly. I mean, he was directly looking at them just like your experience. Uh They would be there one moment, the next moment they had vanished, they would be in another part of the room. 
Can I ask a question? Did did sure. they did they show when he looked at them? Uh, did they show any movement at all of, of what appeared to be a, a human body? They he described them as being in human in form, and that they would sometimes move. You know, he would see what appeared to be an arm moving. Mm. Uh, sometimes it, they would appear to bend forward as if they were looking at him closer. Mm. But Art, the, this took a very frightening turn when one night after work, John went out, had some food with a friend. He came home late. He says that he walked in. He he glanced at his mail. He checked his email quickly. He went to his bedroom, kicked his shoes off, and sat down on the side of the bed. He had not turned the lights on because there was light from outside that sort of shone into the room, right. giving some illumination. He was sitting there looking out the window when all of a sudden he felt what he described as a pair of hands grab his ankles oh, God. and yank. He was slammed down, face down, onto the floor, oh, twisted onto his side with something holding his ankles. And says that he what he describes seeing was a black form under the bed with glowing red eyes oh. pulling his legs. He just in a, a moment of panic flailing around grabbed hold of uh, a radiator. He had lived in an older home, had those old fashioned radiators that you know literally have pipes running down into the floor. So it was very sturdy. And he wrapped both arms around that radiator and was kicking his legs and screaming and trying to get loose from this thing. I, I absolutely get that part. Um, I would be holding on for dear life. And if, if my thing had had red eyes, I probably wouldn't be here right now because... It put me in a state of terror. I really, really hate. You may not know. We've never talked. Have we ever done an interview, David? <laughs> no, we no, haven't. No, that's right. Okay, so the, the, one of my phobias, one of my real fears is glowing red eyes. So had my shadow person had red eyes, it would be not me describing this to you right now because I would have had a heart attack and died. Right. <laughs> well, uh John managed to, you know, he, he somehow fought through the fear enough to focus. I, I mean, he was in panic mode. Don't get me wrong. All he could think about was, was getting loose from this thing because he, he told me, Art, he said that he knew if this thing drug him under the bed that he would just be gone. And and he told me, he said, David, I don't know what would have happened to me, where I would have been, you know, what – if anyone would have found anything, but he, he's just convinced that he just would not be here anymore. And in his moment of, of terror and crisis, he says that he started praying. You know, he reverted back to his, uh, you know, his upbringing of, of going to church every week, and that's what he resorted to, and he just started screaming prayers at this thing, all the while kicking and trying to get loose. And... It was, you know, it's it's such a frightening encounter when you listen to this man pouring his heart out and, and reliving this terror, recounting this experience of this thing attempting to drag him into some kind of void. And, you know, he ended up letting go of the radiator and grabbing the nightstand next to the bed, yanking out his Bible and continuing to... To, to pray and, and started reading passages from the Bible while fighting this thing and somehow he, he got loose from it and you know he says that he jumped up he went across the room he's turning lights on he's screaming at his bed you know screaming at this thing that he believes is still under there and then you know his his fear started to turn to anger because of being victimized and he ended up, you know, kicking against the bed and, and finally just shoving the bed aside, and there's nothing there. Okay. 
Um, I have, I guess, one little additional detail that I can say. I'm sorry to be talking about what I saw, but maybe this means something and maybe it means nothing. This thing did not move, uh, and it seemed to me when it was on my right that it just disappeared, and as I swung, you know, swung around, there it was on the back wall. Then it was to my left, and that's when I was just utterly freaking. But have you, have you uh, ever seen when the Starship Enterprise goes into warp drive? Oh, sure. Right. You, you go, you know. Yes. Well, I had just a little tiny bit of that. It wasn't a full Starship Enterprise going into warp drive. It, but there was right. a little bit of that in as it disappeared the third time. You could see a little... And that that was it, gone. As if it went through a portal. Uh, well, you know, I don't know what it went through. I don't even know what it did. But I, I'm just telling you that effect, if you can imagine that effect on a, sure. a kind of a minuscule uh, level, that that one on my left, uh, when it left, it headed, would have been the direction of the house, going into the house uh, from the back of the house where my ham shack is. And right. there was that little tiny effect, not a big effect, a little one. Uh, that's the only movement that I could even imagine to describe. Otherwise, uh-uh, nothing. I, I've heard other people report similar things to that when these shadow people leave. And now some people will say that it looks like uh, the shadow or the darkness gets sucked into something suddenly. I guess it could be described that way. Right. And, um, of course, there are other accounts of these things leaving by going into mirrors. Yeah, mirrors are interesting. Huh. And they are indeed. And, you know, a mirror in a dark room, <laughs> um, it, it kind of adds to the eeriness of some of these encounters, you know, some... It, cultures around the world have a lot of things connected with mirrors and believe that uh, those are sometimes um, can be used as portals or gateways into other realities essentially um, of the shadow people stories that you hear how many of them um, result in some sort of physical confrontation there are aren't a lot of accounts where the shadow people make physical contact. Now, there are physical elements occasionally in that, you know, they will at times uh, cause things to move in the room. Of course, there are accounts where people will, you know, get really frightened and, and throw something, which inevitably just goes through these beings. So, you know, the the physical components, when they do show up, as in John's account, uh, tend to be pretty frightening and, and pretty stunning. But fortunately, there are a, a very, very small number of those at this point. But I have to point out that reports of these shadow beings continue to grow every year. There are more and more encounters showing up across the spectrum. Do you want to venture a guess why? These things. Yeah, do you want to venture a guess why? You know, I, I think there's a, a number of things that contribute to that. Uh, the the paranormal in general, and I, I use that term very broadly. You know, I, I'm old school. I started this stuff in the 70s, and back then paranormal meant, you know, anything outside the norm. So, you know, I think that it, it's become such a part of pop culture now with all the reality shows and movies and everything else that people have become, one, more open to discussing their experiences and two right. there right. are more people looking i mean we have more you know ghost hunting teams and ufologists and cryptozoologists now than we've ever had in history you know huh. it's it's a worldwide interest so more and more people looking then yeah more and more things are going to be found and more reports are going to be registered yeah maybe but it it seems to me that looking for a ghost taking like a camera crew out and hunting for a ghost has a very small chance of success unless you're going to a place that has had lots of really recent encounters and you know is re really a hot zone or something but hey i'm 70 years old now david this was my first uh experience with a anything like this right 
Right. Well, you know, I mean, to, as another answer to your question, we could sort of go down the rabbit hole and examine it in different ways because, you know, uh, spiritual people, shaman, would tell you that the planet's in a, a very different um, phase right now. So the the spiritual worlds are starting to come more in contact with our level of reality. And, you know, alongside of that, we could also say, well, What's the human element in terms of of our mental focus and our energy doing to possibly co-create some of these? I don't know. Back up for me, David. You said our planet is in a different what? You know, everybody got hyped up a few years ago about 2012. Remember that? Yes. Lots of craziness, and everybody was proclaiming us that, you know, the the world's going to end and blah, blah, blah. Well, they tagged a lot of this onto Mayan uh, spiritual elders claiming this because the calendar was ending. But in reality, that's not what those guys were saying. I, I've met with some of those elders. And really what they were saying and what a lot of uh, native elders around the world are saying is that the world is, is it's going through a transformation because culturally and spiritually and politically and everything else, we're at a lot of crisis points. And it's all kind of coalescing into a forced transformation. I mean, face it, you look at the nightly news and you know that there are a lot of breaking points that are going to start showing up. The world's going to start changing. And when you coincide that with our personal viewpoint and experience of the world around us, then that's bringing some different things to light. Um. Okay. Uh, you, you said the the planet had shifted in, in some way. Um, say that again, please. Well, you know, tribal elders talk about um, moving into different worlds. The whole reason the Mayan calendar ended was because a cycle was ending, and it means that we're starting a new cycle. I figured they just got tired of making calendars. <laughs> no. Um so, you know, what they, the way they interpret that is that a spiritual cycle comes to an end. Oh. And that when it comes to an end, uh, we reach a, a crisis point where a lot of things have to change. You know, it's sort of a natural evolution. It's just that they viewed it uh, not just in terms of, of uh, you know, physical terms, politics and, and things like that, but also in spiritual terms. So uh, I know we're kind of really <laughs> getting into uh, the, the spiritual side of things, and some of this is, is difficult to relate in short terms. I'm trying my best. I don't care but, where it goes as long as I learn something about these creatures. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know about being in a different... You know, I know the Mayan calendar ended. Um, I don't know that we're in some different spiritual realm right now, that we passed over some magical date, uh, and if we did, I'd like to know when it was. Well, let me put it in different terms. So, you know, if okay. we go back to this idea that quantum science is talking about the, quote, discovery of other dimensions of existence, mm -hmm. we can sort of correlate that with uh, ancient spiritual teachings that believe that we come to certain points in the evolution of the world where it's easier for those levels of existence to sort of cross over with each other. The, the veil gets thinner, so to speak. And when that happens, there's more interaction with whatever dwells in those other levels of reality. Whatever the, dwells. <laughs> whatever dwells there. And, um, you know, you go back through history and you look at a lot of these cultures and, and, there's so many legends of other beings that used to live here with us. And at some point in the tribe's history, they, these other beings leave. They go through a shimmering doorway or, you know, a hole in the mountain. There's mm -hmm. this various ways it's described. And if we try to put that in scientific terms and look at quantum science, we can say, well, it sounds like whatever these things were, they used to live here. They used to be here, and they left through some kind of portal. <laughs> so we're coming back around to points, according to a lot of shaman, where it's easier for these things to come back through and come over here again. Portal is just a word. I mean, are you talking about 
moving from one dimension uh, into another or back and forth between. That's correct. Both. Uh-huh. It's, so it's an entry point. It doesn't seem like, uh, you know, if you say the word portal, it seems like door or little passageway, but it doesn't seem that way. It just seems like these things drift in and out. I'm not objective about this. Um, I, I wonder how I get objective about this. You know, my experience drove objectivity from me. Uh, that's that's how bad it is. Uh, you know, I'm so wanting answers, and you're not going to have them <laughs> ultimately. And so that's a little frustrating. But it, it's hard to be objective, uh, David, when when you you've had this experience. And I thought, boy, I'll have David on. He'll give me the answers. <laughs> I, I just can't be objective. <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, Eric. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's you all know, right. these these are things that uh, people have been looking for answers for for a very long time, and it's just that, unfortunately, you know, for someone who's had a frightening experience like you have, mm-hmm. there's there's not anything that is really going to. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but really completely set you at ease with it. Because what I find from interviewing people who've had these experiences, there's always this nagging fear in the back of their minds oh, yeah. that the thing is going to show up again. Or worse, uh, and get or physical, um, something like that. Yeah. Or that it's a, it portends something, or you know, who knows, um, except that it scared me so badly. Um, so who knows? Uh, anyway. Shadow people have been around since when, about? Oh, gosh. You know, we can find reports, uh, as I stated earlier, going back to the medieval period that talked about these shadow monks or these phantom monks. And uh, you find a lot of common things with modern shadow people encounters. Uh, People would say that these figures looked like they had a, a monk's robe and a hood on. There wouldn't be any discernible features. Sometimes there would be glowing eyes. Mm-hmm. But they would radiate this this anger or this very you know disturbing creepiness about them, and you know people consistently report that these shadow beings uh, appear to be observing them, and that's one of the most unsettling things. Well, that's what you know? brought me to my first turn to my right was I did feel something watching. Um, that's um, a very interesting human ability to know when you're being watched. Animals have it even better than we do, but mm-hmm. but you know when you're being watched. Hey, you feel something trend. There it is. And so, yeah. Oh, sure. Um, okay, I want to ask this. Does having seen one of these things once make it more likely that you will uh, see it again? Well, <laughs> I have to be honest with you. Yes, it does. Oh, great. Um, there, I, I would say that the greater percentage of people who encounter these things, yes, do see them again at some point. Okay. Of the the stories that you're aware of and the people you have talked to, uh, is there an effective? I don't know if defense is the right word. Uh, a way, a way to have these things be gone. There are things that you can do. Yes. Now, some people get so terrified that they resort to, uh, you know, sleeping with the lights on and so forth because because they have their experience in a completely darkened room. Um, what's interesting is that what often seems to be effective for people is using music in the background. Okay, you know what, I hadn't said this, Uh, let me say it now so that everybody understands. Uh, In the room in which I had this experience, I have a a fan, you know, a ceiling fan, and attached to that fan are four 60-watt bulbs going to each corner of the room. So this is a well-lit room. Um, Maybe that helps everybody out there understand what the conditions were like, but, uh, you know, 460-watt bulbs, that produces plenty of light, so no trick of shadow here. Um, (sighs) All right, well, um, so I was asking about defense. (laughs) 
Right. And, you know, there, as I started to say, there are a handful of things. You know, a lot of people tend to resort to their uh, spiritual roots. And, you know, they will do things if they were raised Catholic, they'll start saying the rosary again, things like this. Mm. And a lot of people find that that works for them. People who don't necessarily have that kind of spiritual foundation try to find other ways to essentially disrupt whatever possibly allows these things to come in. So, Yes, and is, has thing anything thing, been proven to be effective? Well, you know, what I've had a lot of success with in giving people is having them play classical music in the background. Now, oh, there are some interesting studies that say that, you know, classical music assists the brain. It, it raises your level of creativity and so forth. <laughs> and uh, it, it seems to be that for a lot of people, this helps sort of settle the mind so that these disturbing, more disruptive things don't come in. Well, that's going to be a problem for me. I'm not a classical music fanatic at all. Um, right. <laughs> for me, it's rock. <sighs> okay. All right. Um, are there any geographic areas in in the world where these kinds of things are more common? They're very common around locations that have a history of haunting particularly older locations there's something called the the stone theory that relates to hauntings and we find that a lot of times shadow people tend to show up around those locations too uh, it's essentially an idea that things like limestone um, areas with a lot of heavy quartz in the foundation and so forth can either attract entities or make it easier for things like this to come through. And as a result, a lot of locations, you know, you go to Europe and a lot of these older castles and so forth that are are very haunted, there'll be uh, shadow people reports okay. a lot of the times. All right. How about this, another, David? Another factor that comes in, Art, and let me, let me uh, interrupt you and throw this in, is that places that have heavy amounts of a heavy history of, of negative things, you know, like uh, old asylums, uh, mm. prisons, things like that. It's very common to find shadow people reports around those types of locations. Okay. I guess. So I, we're I'm... sort of getting into the emotional aspect with that. You know, a lot of emotional trauma and so forth um, seems to make it easier for these things to come in. And, you know, even on a small personal scale, mm. I find that a lot of the people that I've interviewed who, who, you know, they don't live in a haunted location, they don't, you know, none of the other parameters fit. But what is often found is that things are going on in their lives that create high levels of stress mm. or trauma mm. or, you know, I emotional turmoil. Those all seem to be elements that help create these negative experiences. Hmm. See, I'm trying to relate everything to myself. Um, my home life was great. I've got the best wife in the world, a great daughter. Um, so no stress there. There was stress, I guess, because I had this upcoming show. Sorry, I'm trying to relate everything to myself. I'm trying to come up with answers. And here's the other thing I meant to ask you, David. It is, look, shadow person is just a phrase. It's the one I came up with when I saw this damn thing. Um, I guess I should be not saying damn thing, darn thing. I don't want to make it angry, just in case. <laughs> um, so it's just a phrase. You know, m maybe I could have said I saw a ghost. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, shadow person seemed more to fit what I saw. But, you know, that's a good question. Um, could it have been a ghost? It, it is, and I see where you're going with that. And, you know, it's it's really a good point because shadow people, shadow person has sort of become this catch-all phrase over the last oh, 10 years or so. And what is most likely is that there are a lot of different things that are being thrown into those categories because there are variations. You know, some of them appear to be very malevolent. 
like the account that I, I um, related earlier with John, you know, this thing, whatever it was, was really out to get him. Yes. But there are plenty of other accounts of these things that there's no physical contact. And while it's creepy and, and scary, these things almost appear to just be observing. You know, people will report these things manifesting in their room and they'll, you know, suddenly be leaning over the bed as if they're trying to get a good look at the person and mm-hmm. then they vanish. So it seems that we have a lot of different manifestations all thrown into one category. And and honestly, you know, we could go down a lot of different roads to say, hey, this is what they probably are. I remember years ago uh, interviewing people about shadow people and some of the callers said, you know what, I confronted this being, I stare, stared back at it or talked to it or yelled at it or something, and it seemed startled. Now, of course, I had no ex- experience like that, but that was interesting, almost like this being was as startled as the person it was scaring. Right. And, you know, those accounts do show up, too. It's, it's as if... Uh they think they're they're covertly spying on us or something uh, but to be examined in turn is is a bit shocking to them um, if they you know, are it, of another dimension it, yeah if they are of another dimension then maybe they're as shocked at popping into this one as we are to see them very possible very possible and you know here's another possibility i mean they <laughs> Uh, they may be having some kind of a fairly normal existence and and seeing us and are just as surprised, wondering, you know, what is that? (sighs) Okay. Um, Anyway, not so many physical attacks. That's a much smaller percentage, right? It's a very small percentage at this point, yes. That makes me feel so much better. Um, How many reports of those glowing red eyes? That is a pretty good percentage um probably you know from the cases i've looked at at least a third of them report these things having glowing eyes (sighs) lucky me got the two-thirds that don't have glowing red eyes Uh, (laughs) okay well um shadow people i'm sure that's going to be an ongoing subject but i i know that you cover many more things and um because I'm having such a hard time being objective about this, I do want to ask you about these black-eyed children. I actually got a call not long ago, first time I ever heard of black-eyed children. Somebody called and said they saw one, and um, it was very, very startling to them, and it weird, and they belonged, and they were with parents that looked blonde and not related to these children at all. It was very weird. Wow, yeah. Well, Art, you think the shadow people are creepy. Uh, <laughs> these black-eyed kid accounts are, are very unsettling. And, you know, here's a, a typical scenario to sort of set the stage for you. Um, you know, imagine you've just come home from work, you know, the sun is just going down, and, you know, you're maybe in the kitchen fixing yourself a drink or something and suddenly there's a knock at the door it's not a quick rap it's it's a long continuous monotonous knocking that doesn't stop Mm -hmm. like anybody you know things are going to run through your mind what wow why didn't they use the doorbell who's coming by what's going on as you're heading for the door you open the door here are a pair of kids standing on your porch they're kind of looking down at their shoes they're wearing sort of just drab mundane clothing and when you open the door in a very monotone voice one of the kids says hey we just thought we'd come in for a bit (laughs) now Mm. you've never seen these children (laughs) you know you don't have any kids of your own all these things are running through your mind and and your response is, uh, I think you guys have the wrong house. That that Again, would be a mild response. <laughs> this monotone response is, we'll just come in anyway. <laughs> oh, man. Now, 
inevitably what happens in these encounters is that the victim, for lack of a better word, goes through three very rapid stages. Uh, There's an initial unease when they open the door, and they're never quite sure why. And that unease grows to (laughs) nervousness, you know, as they're trying to deal with these kids. And, you know, some people will try to question them or or interact with them or or figure out, you know, why are these kids at my door? Mm. Inevitably, these kids will raise their heads and make eye contact. And at that point, what the person sees is a child with solid black eyes. No colored pupils, no whites of the eyes, nothing, just a solid black eye. And uh, the level of fear sort of goes off the charts at that point. The, right. the victim will slam the door. And there's a whole range of things we hear in these encounters. These kids are described as having uh, pale or pasty skin. Some mm-hmm. people say it looks artificial. They always speak in very monotone voices. And they always make requests. They want you to invite them inside. They want to come inside. Sometimes it'll be a simple request, you know, but it's usually something bizarre. You know, uh, there was an account where some kid said, you know, it it looks like it's going to rain. Will you invite me in? Mm -hmm. I think vampires require an invite, don't they? Uh, that's correct. Uh, you know, classic not like that lore is says that a, a vampire cannot cross the threshold oh, yeah, unless yeah. it's invited. But the same is true. You know, classical demonology says that uh, a demonic entity or force has to have some type of invitation before it can come inside. These accounts, uh, they, they are so creepy, Art, and they really, they hit... Um, they hit the internet in the late 90s. There was a journalist out of Texas that had an encounter with these kids, and he's the one that sort of really start the, started the, the modern wave, so to speak, of these accounts. So do you, you, do you, let me stop you. Do you believe, you said it hit the internet, do you believe that this is yet another internet-generated weirdness or is it real you know initially when i heard these i uh, like you're saying i thought wow this is probably this is very curious but it may be some internet phenomena it may right. just be some you know urban legend right but then i started meeting people who had encountered these things and i decided to really examine the phenomena to go back in history and see what I could find that predated the internet and even television. Because, you know, we have to remember that things like the classic X-Files uh, in the 90s, you know, they used this black eye uh, phenomena, you know, with that uh, oil alien that came in and gave a person solid black eyes. So it was interesting, and I thought, okay, well, we've got to see where this goes. Uh, chapter on shadow people in Strange Intruders. That's okay. one of the things I covered in there. Okay. And uh, in fact, if uh, people are seeing the image of the cover of that probably on your website, they'll see that there is a shadow being on the cover of that amongst some other uh, very disturbing entities. Really? Okay. Yes. I am now, uh, this is uh, on my website, I presume. I I believe it is. Uh, <laughs> racing over there right that. now. Anything that cover for that? <laughs> Anything that shows me a photograph of what I might have seen. Okay, I see your picture. Um, let's see. Read more, and perhaps we've got your uh, a picture of your book on here. I don't know. Um, well, not yet. All right, I'll 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 keep. Uh, Keep reading here and see. Okay, so I see... Well, that has nothing to do with it. Okay, I'm not there yet. So where should I go? Uh, you can go to my blog, which is twocrowsparanormal.blogspot.com. Okay. And I'm pretty sure there's a link for that on your website. And uh, if you go to that and look along the side column there, you'll see the covers of the books. I am on the way. This is what I mean. I I can't be objective about this. It freaked me out so badly that... um, 
Okay. Yeah, looking at strange intruders. Yeah, and what you'll see is just towards the, uh, you'll see dead center at the bottom is, is the face of a black-eyed child. And right beside that, sort of over his shoulder, is a shadow figure with his hand reaching out towards you. Okay, it was like that, short of the hand. But it really yeah. was like that. And again, I could see through it. I would say it blocked 60 or 70% of what was behind it. It was a well-lit room. So, anyway. Uh, listen, folks, once you've seen this, you can't, you can't unsee it. So there you go. That's that's pretty close to what I saw, but not not the hand. Right, right. Enough and, to know that it was a beam. Variations. Yeah. I, I, so could it? We we touched on the word ghost. I mean, it's just a word. Uh, to you, does the word ghost mean a being that once was alive, David? Um, not necessarily, because I I think that a lot of reports of ghosts are simply residual energy, you know, sort of like a recording. Hmm. You know, when there's, I, I think that there are times that, for instance, there's such a, a powerful or traumatic event that takes place that a, a, a recording, if you will, of that is inlaid into the very landscape or, or the location, and that certain things can trigger that, sort of like a hologram. <laughs> and I believe that that's why in a lot of uh, reports of hauntings, you know, you'll hear about these incidents where, oh, the haunting is that this woman walks the corridor, you know, every uh, October on the 12th. And, and you know, she, she walks down and she vanishes through a wall. Well, a lot of times when you go back to the historical record, you'll you'll find these specific events that tie into things that seem to repeat themselves somehow. Okay, well. My guest last night, Lloyd Auerbach, said the same thing, the exact same thing. That um, oh, okay. <laughs> the, there, it could be some sort of some sort of uh, recording or endless tape loop, however you want to think of it, and it just is there sometimes, and it's always the same thing going on again and again and again and again. And that these things could even be attached to material things like rooms or homes or places. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's why, you know, when you find a, a location that has so much history and, and so much uh, turmoil, you know, like the famous Tower of London, for instance, in England, you know, there are reported ghosts in there. And, of course, there are famous historical events that took place, you know, people that were beheaded and so forth. And there are reports of these apparitions showing up, you know, on the anniversaries of those executions and so forth. And I think we really we get into an area where it, it's something that it's not a technology, but it, it's something that we don't understand in scientific terms that's occurring, that's interacting with us, you know, and, and it is like a recording, whether it's in the, uh, the stone tape theory, like I was talking about earlier, you know, there's an idea that some types of stone heavy and crystal and so forth can hold a recording of something. And that's not too far a leap when we consider a lot of our modern technology relies on crystals. True. Uh, you've been investigating this for 35 years, this kind of stuff, right? That's correct. Okay, so has any of this ever happened to you? I've had some pretty strange experiences over the years, and um, one of the things I, I saw that really sort of... Uh, I, I saw a grinning man. And, of course, you can call us on Skype as well at, um, in North America, MITD51, MITD51. Out in the rest of the world, MITD55. That covers a lot of the world. Somebody said, uh, it's Doug in Michigan. Thanks for this, Doug. Art, you've got more stones than me. You talking about this thing just might bring it back again. Have you considered that? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Doug in Michigan, for that. Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so the grinning man. That's at least a new one on me, thank goodness. <laughs> well, my personal <clears throat> account uh, relating to the grinning man, or it happened in the, the 1980s. This was in a, a rural area of North Carolina, and 
You know, there's a whole theory that sometimes certain combinations of, of people can create unusual experiences. And uh, at the time, I had a friend who, his name was Tom, and it seemed like any time we sort of went off exploring things that unusual things would happen. And uh, this particular incident was that we were driving on this, literally on a country road, uh, very few houses, you know, they were miles apart. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, late summer. We're driving along at a leisurely pace, and we're coming to uh, this uh, sort of long curve in the road. And I see on the right-hand side, I was in the passenger seat. Tom was driving. I see on the right-hand side of the road uh, a figure standing in the weeds. And this is very unusual. You, You just, you never saw anyone walking around in this part of the country. And, uh, as we approach this figure, I'm kind of zeroing in on it and thinking this looks very strange. As I said, it was late summer. I realized this gentleman is wearing a long coat. It's sort of Victorian in style. He has on a, a formal hat that's sort of like a top hat. Mm. One, his his right hand is under his chin, and he's sort of rubbing his his thumb and his fingers together. Mm-hmm. Uh, his other arm is not visible; it's just hanging down at the side. And beneath this coat is this very wide silver, shiny belt, almost like something you'd see on a, on a science fiction show or something that's right. that wide. Mm-hmm. But art the creepiest thing was he had this grin that it it made me think of the Joker from the Batman comics. Mm. It was an impossibly large grin that no one could physically smile like this. As we approached this figure, it seemed as if time sort of slowed down for a few seconds, as if we were moving past him very, very slowly. Now, Tom has no memory of of letting his foot off the gas or anything. It's just that something very strange happened when we were passing this figure, and I locked eyes with him. He was glaring right through the window looking at us. And the moment we were beyond him, you know, past him, I spun my head around to look out the rear window. And this figure is now standing in the very center of the road watching our car. Wow. It, it is, it's, it's physically impossible that he could have moved that quickly. So, you know, we continue to go forward, and, and Tom is almost in a panic, and I'm sort of uh, I, I'm badgering him to stop the car and, and to turn around because I want to see what this is. Huh. And, you know, we argue for a few seconds, and, I, I, you know, he's insistent that this guy is probably some, you know, psycho killer or something. And, <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I'm, you're the one with the stones. Turn around and go back and see what it is. Good Lord, man. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I finally, you know, Tom is convinced. You know, this is the 1980s. This is the era of, you know, Friday the 13th and all that crazy stuff. And Tom thinks it's just <laughs> some nutty guy. And I'm So I finally convince him to, look, just do a U-turn. We'll go partway back and see if he's still there which Tom finally does. Mm. And he, he does a U-turn. He goes almost all the way back, and he stops the car, and, and I jumped out because I wanted to go see if I could find this thing. And uh, I went to the area where he was standing. There was evidence of, of, you know, someone had physically had been standing in these weeds because the weeds were mashed down. But, you know, the the woods in this area, very thick, and no one wearing that kind of attire mm-hmm. could have quickly gotten through those trees to disappear. And, you know, he wasn't running down the road or anything like that. And as the rest of the evening unfolded, some other odd things occurred. Uh, the house next door to Tom's was struck by lightning, and a fire started. And <laughs> several people in the same area reported UFO sightings. Hmm. And, you know, I didn't know at the time whether, you know, do you tie all these things together or not? Well, it's certainly a strange series of, uh, you know, encounters that all happen around the same time. Well, I ended up discussing this with John Keel, who 
you know, he, he was he was kind of an influence on me. I, I met him a number of times, and he did a lot of uh, interesting research. And he had researched what he called the grinning man. And that is what he dubbed these types of encounters with these weird figures with a hideously large grin. Now, Art, I know you've got a lot of loyal fans. I was able to jump onto the forum uh, where people are listening for just a few moments, and I see that a lot of people are, are very interested in clowns. And it turns out that a lot of these grinning man encounters almost seem like bizarre clown-type figures. Uh, Keel investigated a case in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, of a family who this this young woman uh, swears that suddenly at the foot of her bed was standing a man with a hideously large grin and a checkered shirt. And he sort of leaned over her bed and looked at her very closely. And, uh, of course, she was screaming for her mother and hid beneath the covers and this figure vanished. But what 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 chat room are you in? Oh, what? I I was I jumped on the uh, what's it called? Um, Don't know. I said uh, midnight uh, midnight fans. Midnight fans. Okay. All right. And there. That's the right one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. That's one of them. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. So they're interested in clowns. Um, hmm. And, well, a lot of people were saying they were afraid of clowns. So, you know, um, some of these figures, it's it's very curious how a lot of these things seem to hit on primal fears that people have, mm-hmm. you know, just like the shadow people. Things that are, are slightly off or intangible or, or just invoke some type of... Um, you know, almost a childlike feeling. All right. All right. So I, I want to go back to where you uh, said turn around. You turned around. Um, the car stops, and you get out of the car to go look for this being. You know, if this had been a movie, that's where they break away, and they show a couple of detectives, <laughs> right? And and there's, like, pieces of David Weatherly scattered all over the road and the adjacent countryside, and they're saying, well, we'll have to get somebody to look at the DNA and see if each one of these adds up to David Weatherly. <laughs> In other yeah, words, you I... <laughs> went back. Why in God's name would you go back and get out of the car? Anybody who's seen you know, a terror I... movie all knows how... <laughs> It ends up. Yeah. You know, Art, um, ever since I was really young, I, I was just very compelled by this, you know, all these weird things. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I grew up reading Fate magazine and, and watching, you know, In Search Of and, and you know, uh, all of these things just really, it, it's sort of my passion to pursue these things. And, um you know, someone asked me recently if I if I'd ever been really frightened in these situations, and to tell you the truth, I just I don't really think about it. I, I go into these situations hmm. because I, I want I want answers. I want the you know I want to know. Okay, well, uh, just remember how it works in the movies. <laughs> um, we're going to take some calls, um, David. Um, let's go to Knoxville, Tennessee. Say hello there. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hey. Hey, I just wanted to say you're right on the money about these shadow people because I've only seen one in my life, but it was in this new house that we moved into about 10 years ago, and I still live in the house. But my dog and I, we saw this figure that looked exactly like a human wearing a black bodysuit over its face. Mm-hmm. And it moved so quickly, it went into my son's room, so help me. And we, I now this sounds crazy, but I ran after it, and my dog did too. We ran right to that. No, it doesn't sound crazy, ma'am. Uh, a mother is very protective of a child, and so, yeah, I get it. Well, I, I just, I had to tell you, you know, that this stuff is real, and that's the one and only I've ever seen. But my daughter swears that she saw a shadow figure go behind the water heater and that it lived behind the water heater. So don't tell me where they live, but I can tell you that this has to be connected with UFOs. 
Oh, uh, well. I, that's happened to me my whole life. And you guys just brought up this checkered shirt thing. So help me God, there was this figure that came to the foot of my bed wearing a checkered shirt. It said to me, it said it in a low, growling voice, beware of the Bosch. Well, my, my daughter and I, we were so fascinated with what that meant. We looked it up on the Internet, and what it means is beware of the fiery furnace. And I want you to know all this stuff is, like, interrelated. It's sort of like you've walked into another world that's right beside of you, and I don't know why that it happened to us, but it's happened to a lot of people. All right, ma'am. Well, yeah. thank thank you for the story. And it is like you move uh, from one world to another, and maybe that being is coming from another world. I, I don't know. It's as good an explanation as any. We talked about that earlier. So that's, that's something to grab onto, I suppose, and kind of hopeful in a sense, uh, because one of the great questions in life, David, is whether there's anything else after life. Oh, absolutely. And even even the existence of another dimension that can be moved um, into and out of uh, sort of starts to answer that question a little bit. Possibly. And, and you know, our, one of the, the many theories to explain what these shadow beings are are that they are, you know, just the souls of people that have passed away and are sort of in some kind of in-between space you know, before they've fully crossed over. So, um, you know, who knows? She she did bring up an interesting point in her account, too, that uh, her dog noticed. Mm-hmm. And that's something that's very interesting because you find a it lot is. of these shadow people accounts that uh, people who have pets, their animals very often notice these things before the human does. You know, well, the, uh, thank God I didn't have one of my growling. cats on my lap, David, or it would have left a... Uh, <laughs> Horrible marks when this thing appeared. Uh, they always do when a cat gets startled. The back claws come out and they oh, yeah. launch. Um, overseas somewhere, um, I believe. Me, myself, and I. Yes. Hey, hey there. Ar- hello. Ar- this is Philip. Yes. Hello, Philip. Where are you? I'm in Brazil. Brazil. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Wow. I know. A long time fan. This is so great to hear you back on the air. Thank you. Uh, and I'm enjoying the show. And I just wanted to uh, tell a short uh, story that I had with a shadow person. Uh used to freak me out when I was 15 listening to your show uh, about shadow people. And then I actually had an experience with one when I was still in the U.S. <laughs> uh, at university, I was sleeping in the dorm room and uh, kind of in and out of sleep, you know, in the middle of the night, I actually saw the door open and I thought that it was the person that I was sharing the dorm room with but it wasn't I turned I had a little bit of sleep paralysis going at the same time I turned and I saw a very tall dark figure I mean it was the size of the the, I guess the door you know coming in and it jumped on the bed on top of me and I actually felt the pressure I mean I'm getting goosebumps just telling you the story I felt the pressure of this figure on top of me and pushing down on me I couldn't move I was trying to uh, vocalize something kind of scream out and I couldn't and from that day on it was almost as if I was possessed like things in my life just bad things started happening so I don't know if you could ask your guest if there's any connection with shadow people actually attacking people and actually having the full exposure of this uh i don't know what they are i just after that happened i got very freaked out about them i don't know what they are either um sure uh we'll ask um yo guest (laughs) (laughs) uh thanks for calling in philip all the way from brazil you know the account that he's describing art sort of uh broaches over into another phenomena and that's the night hag and these often sound uh, very similar to shadow people encounters, but what's inevitable with these experiences is that the person will see sometimes a, a, just a shadowy mass or figure. Sometimes it's described as, as a hideous, almost deformed 
old woman, hence mm. the, the night hag term. Yes. But these shadowy beings inevitably will climb on the person's chest when they are sleeping mm. and, uh, you know, apply this overwhelming pressure. Now, modern science attributes a lot of this to sleep paralysis. But, uh, you know, some of the accounts are, are very difficult to dismiss in those, you know, simple scientific terms because people have these lasting effects from what they feel is you know, 100% a physical encounter with <laughs> these things. And, uh, you know, yes, there are occasions where people, you know, continue to, to need a recovery period where they have strange things in the aftermath of these experiences. They're, they're very frightening by all accounts. What about um, sort of a heart attack? I mean, that, that feels almost like a crushing of the chest, right? I, I've heard it described that way um, and or part of sleep paralysis, uh, but, but you're saying there's a being attached to this. Right. At, at times, you know, there's a lot of people who uh, suffer through sleep paralysis and uh, as I said, modern science tends to say that these, quote, night hag attacks are uh, a result of that sleep paralysis, essentially that, you know, the person is, is generating so much fear because they are paralyzed and can't physically move that the mind is creating other effects to go with the experience. And, mm. you know, the sense that uh, they're trying to rationalize what's happened, right? I mean, suddenly, you know, just imagine suddenly, you know, you're laying in bed and you can't move a muscle you know your, your entire body is is suddenly not within your control so the the brain is trying to rationalize exactly what's going on uh, david and science has a guess for all of these things up to and including an nde you know the brain correct. cells dying um various things being released they've got a and that's all it is it's a guess about what it is and that i'm Absolutely. sure would be true of the, the chest as well all right most of the others do seem to happen at night any thoughts on that 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 is more common uh i think that you know logically we could even say that tends to be the quieter time you know people tend to be alone or up late working like you were and, and things like that are yes are uh you know definitely a, a part of the whole experience um you know so much stimulus and so much going on during a typical day and most people are out at work and so forth so we we find fewer experiences but there are indeed accounts of these shadow beings during the daytime hours but more common at night right much more common at night yes right i guess the brain has a little more time to Oh, uh, no. If I, it wouldn't matter. If I'd seen this during the day, it would have been exactly the same. Uh, Stephen on Skype, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. Um, so I think I just wanted to tell you a story about an incident that I had when I was uh, like a young kid. Um, sure. With what I think was a shadow person. Yes. Um, I was about maybe seven or eight. Um, also, just to preface this, um, we lived in a small house, my family. Um, we lived there my whole life up to that point. Um, the way my house was set up was just, it was really small. Um, my my room was next to my parents' room, like literally right next to it, and my sister's room was right across the hall. It was maybe like 800 square feet. Um, so I think I was seven or eight years old. Um, I'm like, I'm laying in my bed. Uh, I'm wide awake. I'm thinking about, like, it's like 9 o'clock. It wasn't terribly late. I was always like a little night owl. I was always up to all hours of the night. Um and I'm thinking about playing like Pokemon or whatever. Um, it's, it's, it's around that time. And I'm looking out of my doorway and I'm laying in my bed and all of a sudden I just see me, basically, um, come out of my parents' room and oh. round the door and walk right into my room. <laughs> you saw and yourself? Th th the, th the thing is, um, that's, that's like what I said to myself, like at the time. Um, what I saw was I saw a shadow of it wasn't like a, like a shadow, like a shadow person, like you saw, like a like a person, like standing in the room. Mm. It was the shadow. It was a shadow, like on the ground, as if I was the actual person, like but I was invisible, say, walking out of my parents' room, um, and just my shadow was on the floor. It was going and it was walking right into my room. It was a shadow of like a little boy about like my age, <laughs> walking from their room into my room. Yes. Now the thing about that is. I found out a couple years later, maybe like eight or so, like maybe like ten years later, something like that, um, that in the same house, um, my mom also had like two miscarriages, like right before me. 
Yes. So I don't I don't really know what that was about. So So you're you're thinking that could be um oh my goodness. Um interesting, huh? David. David? That's a interesting set of uh <laughs> of things. I, I mean I, I thought at first he was talking about literally a, a doppelganger, you know, which is a a supposed duplicate of a person, but this this sounds more like some type of um you know, ghostly manifestation, for lack of a better word. Uh, really difficult to say whether his mother's miscarriages played into that or, or not. not. I mean, obviously, yeah. that is a very traumatic experience. Uh, but um, I, I don't know. Interesting experience. I know. Um, let's go to uh, Marty. Hello, Marty. Marty's got a lot of echo. Uh, morning, morning, David. Uh, morning. Okay, Marty, um, you've got something wrong on your end. It's echoing like crazy. Can you fix that? No, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Well, we can't continue with that. Uh, Marty, if you can get it fixed, um, by all means, give us a call back. But it was just a, a wreck of a call there. Let's go to the next one on the phone uh, in Phoenix, I think. Hello, Art. Hi. Hi, I'm Dave from Phoenix, and I'm hoping to demystify this experience for you a little bit and explain what you may have seen. Proceed. All right. I have uh, some experience in my in my background. Um, when I was uh, in high school, I was being inducted into a certain three-letter group, uh, a government agency, and saw some things I wasn't supposed to see. And so, um, all this in high school. Yes. Yes, in Walla Walla, and I uh, saw some things I wasn't supposed to see, so I I kind of, uh, I've gone through a lot to be able to help you with this one, but if you if you look on the internet recently, you'll see a uh, supposedly alien uh, sighting at Area 51, and looks like a man in a uh, skin-tight bodysuit. Have you seen that? Uh, no. Okay, well... Uh, I mean, where do I look? Now that I see or hear of these kinds of things, my first assumption is technology. I don't jump to the to the uh, paranormal right off. You know, uh, there's technology that we have that's far beyond that, which most people are aware of. All right. Well, do you know of some technology that actually produces the kind of thing that I saw, and why would they bother with me? Well, uh, yes, I do. And uh, the reason they would bother with you is the same reason they would bother with well, I suppose anybody. Um, a lot of times these these suits that they wear, or in other words, there is actually a person in your house. And so that, that may be more discomforting than the opposite, but that's that's what we're, it boils down to. And so they have the ability to walk around now and not be seen. So people are actually seeing uh, folks. And, of course, they're associated with UFO activity because this uh, breakaway civilization that we have uh, thinks that it's fine if they do these kinds of things and that we don't have privacy. All right. Well, I'm I'm not familiar with anything. Uh, I, I guess there could be a relationship to UFOs, David, and anything in that category. Does there seem to be a relationship or there are sightings when these things occur or what? Uh, you know, in, in a handful of these accounts, yeah, there are, there are some situations where uh, there are UFO sightings in the area and so forth, but um, I have, I really appreciate the call. I have a hard time with that as an explanation because uh, you also have to add in the fact that these things seem to be intangible, uh, you know, more often than not, people say that they can see through them partially or, or that, you yes. know, people will throw something and it'll just go through these beings, so um like you are, I'm certainly not aware of, of any kind of technology that is anywhere close to these two types of phenomena yet at this point. All right. Um, to Manitoba, hello. Uh, hi, Art. Uh, thanks for uh, taking me. Sure. Uh, you, yeah. You're not real strong, so you're going to have to speak up good and loud. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I tend to be a quiet talker. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to say uh, or share my story with uh, you guys. I, I had many different shadow person experiences over the years and I guess what I noticed about all my experiences is that they tend to be drawn to that fear reaction but when I don't give that fear reaction back huh. 
either they don't respond or they immediately go away. Well, I'd be re- really, going. really interested in how you react without fear. How do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what? I've experienced that kind of grabbing sensation, the old hag, seeing them while I'm awake, and I guess maybe it's a little bit of a desensitization. But I don't know. I've heard people say meditate on it. Uh, I'm just curious what your what your guest David might have to say on that. All right, David. <laughs> You know, this sort of relates back to John's account from earlier in the show. Uh, I think that in his encounter, he was able to conquer his fear by resorting to his spirituality. And in a lot of cases, I find that people are sort of able to um, zero in their focus on one particular thing. In his case, it was prayer. And that sort of eliminates everything else going on in the, you know, in the mind and the emotional reactions and allows him to just focus on that one thing. Obviously, it's motivated by the fear, but I think that ability to sort of center themselves in is a big component in what allows them to conquer these things or, or you know, eliminate them from their presence. All right, look, um, David, here's something to consider. The phones are berserk. The phone lines are filled. The <laughs> Skype calls are filling my screen so this gives you some idea of how many people have seen something like this i think it is more than just common it's more than we know it's more than people generally are willing to talk about in other words obviously a lot of people are involved here uh let's go to skype and uh tentatively somebody who ids themselves as mv hello uh hello there art hi um Hi, my name is Michael. Um, I'm on the tune-in chat as well, Michael Mars. Shout out to those guys. Okay. Um, Here's my experience. When I was young, I was about six years old. Um, I used to sleep in a room with my sister, who was a year younger than me. Uh And um, I don't know what time of night it was. I opened my eyes up. There was moonlight coming in through the window. And um, I looked. I opened my eyes and looked up in between the two beds that we had, a figure that I can only describe, you know, being a kid looked to me like the jolly green giant, except like white, like a statue, um, kind of like strange, like a Greek statue you might see. And it, it slowly turned down and like looked right down at me. And I just closed my eyes, pulled the covers over my head. <laughs> I was terrified. <laughs> but I don't know. Anyone else had anything similar to that your guests can think of? David? Wow, that's really unusual. Um, there aren't too many encounters with beings that are solid white, as you're describing. There are a few accounts that uh, often are related to UFO encounters, uh, wherein people see you know, what they describe as, as glowing white figures. But no, you know, I, I've never heard of anything like your experience. That's very fascinating, and, and thanks for sharing it. Oh, oh, thank you, and thank you, Art. All right, take care. Uh, just one after another after another. Hello on the phone. You're on the air, wherever you are. Oh, hi. How you doing? I'm John from Lake Villa. Hi, our long-time listener. Uh, can you hear me okay, sir? Well, I hear you. It sounds like you're in a vehicle or something. I'm truck driving through Wisconsin, sir. Truck driving through Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, my, I, I, got a, I was going to tell you my experience, and after that I was going to ask a question, but my experience was around this time last year I actually... I believe I, I encountered what you call a black-eyed child as I was going oh, to work. Really? As oh, I, boy. I was driving to work, and, I mean, I was in my car. And as I was approaching a stoplight, uh, a, a girl come out of the side of the road, and she had her hands up. But when I saw her face, all I saw was black eyes. So, obviously, you know, the hair stood up on the back of my neck, mm. and I kept going. <laughs> So, but my question is, the first person I called was my wife, who's from the Philippines, and is very superstitious. And she related that to a what they call over there an Aswan, I guess. A Aswan. Type. Aswan, yes, sir. And she said, and then, of course, she kind of got worried about me, but I was going to, and she said it's like a vampire type being. And I was like, is, is that what the similar, is that what a black eyed child is related to? Is like a vampire type thing? Well, good question, David. Well, you know, there are similarities with uh, 
the whole lore of vampires when we look at these black-eyed children of course this idea that they have to be invited in whether it's in your home or in your vehicle and um depending on the cultural viewpoint you know people will identify these things that way and you know the similarities are, are not just there there's also the pale skin and the fact that they seem to uh you know some people say these things feel like um predators uh, people will report being in the presence of these black eyed children that they feel like they're being <laughs> you know eyed as a meal or, or you know just uh, <laughs> and I just really looked over you know and, and it causes this incredible level of fear within the people who encounter them you know because you know look art anytime you put something paranormal or, or you know out well outside the norm and mix it with children, it, the creepy level really goes off the scales. And, and it, it also becomes very unsettling because, you know, as, as adults, we're sort of predisposed to help children. You know, if a mm-hmm. child shows up at your door and says, Mr., I need a drink of water or I'm lost, you know, your automatic reaction is going to be to help that child. But when a child shows up and, and is acting really creepy, yes. There's a psychological battle that goes on with a lot of these people I interview. They talk about how confused they are because here's a child asking to come inside, yet all the alarm bells are going off. You know, something is wrong here. It appears to be a child, and and it appears that they need, you know, they want something. They want some kind of help. And, you know, there's a struggle to do I help this child or do I slam the door because I, I feel like I'm being stalked. Uh, um, David, about Slender Man uh, <clears throat> involving some teenage girls. Um, and I, I don't know if that came from a true story. I believe it did. Um, there was an incident, was there not, involving Slender Man and a crime? There was, Art. And. You know, let's say right up front before we get people really worked up, uh, I- I'm sure we're both well aware Slender Man was created on the Internet. However, uh, the weirdness of this, uh, what has become a phenomenon, is it- really creeping into contemporary society. And last year, um, there was an attempted murder. Two 12 year old girls uh, lured a classmate off into the woods and attempted to murder her by stabbing her some outrageous number of times. Uh, fortunately, this little girl survived the brutal attack. But in the aftermath of this crime, it was revealed that these two 12-year-old girls attempted to, quote, sacrifice their friend so that Slender Man would come and take them away to live with him in his mansion in the forest. God. Now, this uh, I, I didn't see the Law and Order that you're referencing, <clears throat> so I don't know how closely it followed, but uh, this was a year ago, and this past March, the first round of this, uh, whatever it was, the pretrial or whatnot, uh, came up, and these uh, the court has determined that these two young girls who have just turned 13 will be tried as adults. Wow. So it, it's, it's a horrendous crime. And, uh, you know, it, it's just it, it's frightening all the way around that something that essentially had its genesis on an Internet forum has now affected a lot of lives. Okay, question. Are they claiming in their defense, or do you know if they're going to claim in their defense, that this was purely Internet-born, almost like Internet porn, (laughs) Internet born, or that there was some um, claim of paranormal activity beyond and away from the computer? You know, I've been trying to follow this very closely, Art, and, and of course, as you would expect, given their age, there's been very little information uh, from the case, even at this point, uh, you know, a year and a half later. So we really don't know what's going to happen when it goes to trial. There, there just hasn't been much mentioned. But the story was repeated numerous times that the, these two little girls believed in the existence of this Slender Man. And, you know, tragically enough, the, the people who created this during the contest – That was the whole goal. They wanted to create something. They wanted to fabricate a paranormal-themed something, entity, you know, cryptid, whatever, Mm. and make it go viral on the Internet and make people believe in its existence. 
So, uh, you know, you can go back. This forum, as far as I know, it, it still exists. It's called Something Awful. And uh, <laughs> it certainly turned out to be something awful. Why? And um, there, there are, you know, thousands of entries about this thing. And, and when it started off, the contest, all kinds of people were contributing different ideas. And then this very creepy, really rather subtle thing at first showed up. And it was this tall figure without a face uh, with these extra appendages that sort of lurked in the background of, of photographs and so forth and began to be attached to different tragedies. Uh, eventually, he started to be called uh, the Slender Man, morphed into one word, Slender Man. And more and more people have jumped in on this thing through the years. There have been you know, video series, there are games, there are all kinds of things. And there's a large percentage of people who absolutely believe in the existence of an entity called the Slender Man. Now, David, you, you, you almost know, have to wonder if intent or mass intent begins to create things. Collective consciousness creating go. something, yeah. and that's there's an ancient belief in what's called a tulpa that is spelled T-U-L-P-A. The ancient Tibetans had this concept that something could be manifested from pure thought all the way into physical form. <laughs> and that's a chilling idea when we look at something like the Slender Man and question what is the collective consciousness co-creating? You know what's a really terrifying thought uh, that springs from that? Um, there is this rumor going around right now on the Internet, on the Internet, David, that uh, <laughs> the end of the world be coming, that an asteroid mm -hmm. is going to slam Earth into little pieces that we're all doomed, that it's the end of the world. Well, if enough people start buying into it, and I'll just leave it right there. On, on Skype, Jeremy, hi, you're on the air. Hi, Art. This is Jeremy from Omaha, and I want to give a shout-out to the DM Talk crowd before I start. Okay. But I've got a, I've got a shadow person story for you. When I was about five or six years old, I was having this problem with seeing shadow people a couple times a week for about two weeks. Um... I had this similar instance where the guy would come out of the wall, a shadow person would come out of my wall mm. and walk through. Um, what I had for a nightlight was one of those cheesy fiber optic night lights back right. in the 80s. Right. And uh, he would walk through that. And every time he would walk through that, the nightlight would go completely dim. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as he got through it, it would come back on again. Oh. And this happened to me at least, you know, four or five times in two weeks. It was pretty scary. People don't understand when, when it really happens to you. Listening to a story is one thing, creepy enough, but having it really happen to you, oh my. Indeed, and I'm pretty skeptical in my, you know, in my older years, so it's weird to think back on it and think, you know, what was that exactly? Well, whatever it was, it, it cut the light down as it went. David, that's pretty weird, huh? It is weird, and... Uh... You know, that's that's another theme that shows up in some of these accounts, that people will have a, a nightlight or, you know, sometimes there's light reflected in the mirror, and these things seem to be able to block them out or, or partially block them out sometimes. Huh. Huh. All right. Uh, I think this is uh, Kel. Kel, is that correct? Kel? Yes, sir. Hi, Kel. Hi, Art. Where are you? In Seattle. I'm sorry? I'm in Seattle. Seattle, okay. Good. Proceed. I, I have a black-eyed kid story. Oh. Yes. Um, I work at night, and I ride my bike to and from work. And I was coming home from work in the morning. It was about 4 in the morning, and it was in the fall, so it was still dark. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, bringing my bike up to my apartment, and there was a little boy in front of the building. And none of my neighbors have kids, so I was wondering, what is this kid doing there? So I said, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Where's your mommy? And he said he was cold. So I said, okay. I put my, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. <laughs> I parked my bike, and I went up to him and said, again, where's your mom mommy? And he didn't say anything. Um, I'll wait here with you. And put my backpack down, stood there for a minute. She didn't show up, so I said, can we call her? Mm -hmm. And I looked at him, and I noticed his eyes were completely black. <laughs> <laughs> and this kid was really weird. He had, like, 
like uh, almost like uh, the wrong clothing, like from the twenties. You know, like really? the, those kids from like Newsies, <laughs> how they had like those caps on and the woolen mm. shorts and really weird shoes, and he was super pale and. Kel, I'm and, at a break. Can you hold? Sure can. All right. Uh, to be sure, and we'll continue that. I've still got Kel on the line, and we'll go back to it in a moment. I just want to say that the the story I began to tell you of Stephen Painter earlier and the shadow person attack, I didn't tell you all of it. It's too long. But uh, come Friday, I'll read the whole thing to you. It's, it is it is indeed creepy. All right, once again, uh, let's go to uh, Kel. You're back on the air, Kel. Thanks, Art. Sure. So... Um, anyway, this this little boy, he was pretty adamant. He said he wanted to come inside. And mm-hmm. I told him I didn't have a landline. I had a cell phone. And once I saw his eyes, you know, as much as I felt compassion for this little boy, there was no way I was letting this kid in my house. And I, you know, I knelt down to get into my backpack to get my cell phone to, to call even though I was completely freaked out of my mind, I looked up to ask him for his mommy's number, and he was gone, completely vanished. Wow. Um, so I was like, oh, that's it, I'm done. Yeah. So I, you know, <laughs> bolted into my house and locked all the doors and windows, and I, that was it for me. Sounds pretty typical, David. It does indeed, and I uh, really appreciate you sharing that with us, uh, Cal. You know, one of the themes she mentioned in that encounter art were these unusual clothing, and that's something that we find <clears throat> in a lot of these encounters with black-eyed children. People will say that the kids are wearing old-fashioned clothing or uh, clothing that, that seems ill-fitting. You know, it's just there's something not quite right about it. Uh, some people think that the clothing is handmade. You know, I've heard more than once uh, people say, oh, they look like Amish kids, you know, like they had had handmade their clothing, but it didn't quite fit right. So it's just another bizarre component of these very disturbing encounters. Yeah, disturbing, all right. Um, All right, let's go to uh, outside the country somewhere to Mario. Uh, Hi, Mario. Oh, hi, Art. How are you going? I'm doing okay. Get good and close to your mic. And uh, Is that that better? It is. Where are you? Yeah, I'm calling all the way from Australia, actually, in uh, Melbourne. Melbourne, Australia, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought I'd share with you guys my story. It occurred when uh, I was a kid, and um, to give you a bit of pre uh, bit of pre-story, um, before I went to sleep, I actually had some uh, newspapers at the end of my bed on the floor, just looking through them and whatnot, and anyway, went to bed and uh, woke up uh, quite late in the night, and I heard some rustling, and I couldn't think of what it was, and then I sort of started thinking about it and it's like sounds like paper and I look to where the sound was which was just at the end of my bed and I see this hooded figure and it kind of looked like a uh, Darth Maul you know that guy from Star Wars yeah. just all black and clearly stood out from everything else in the room and it yeah. I, I just froze like literally like as if someone dumped you in a bath that's just full of ice and you know you got like lemons in your mouth just literally froze right and um i just watched it and it just slowly started walking towards the door and faded into nothing just absolutely nothing and and i did i didn't know what to do i was just literally just didn't didn't have a clue but um anyway it's slowly caught my breath and uh ended up uh going back to sleep um, but the interesting part is, in the morning, I had a look. At People always the- say that. You know, they always say, I went back to sleep, and I don't get that. I I didn't sleep at all. <laughs> I don't know how you could. Yeah, but I, I can understand that. Um, but I kind of didn't know what else to do. Didn't feel like waking up mum and dad. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to go back to sleep. You know, there's not really much option. Um, but by then, it was a bit more morning as well. I, I swear I was up for at least an hour or so. Well, there is an option. It's called huddling in a corner with a weapon. <laughs> oh, that would have been great if I could move. <laughs> um, but look, the, the, the most interesting part out of all of it, um, what I found was that even though I could clearly hear the sound of newspaper, like 
when you hear it, someone walking on the floor across paper, it's clear, you know, you know what, exactly what it sounds like. But there was no prints left on the paper. There was nothing. It was just flat, like there was nothing on it. Uh, well, there you go. Um, one thing's for sure, uh, whatever this is, David, it, it sure is worldwide, huh? Oh yes, ab- absolutely, Art. Uh, I mean, there you know, there he is calling from Australia with an experience, and I've heard them from, you know, that you know all corners of the world. So it, it is, it is a worldwide phenomenon. Akia Lin, I believe it is. Hi. Hey, it's Akaya. Uh, I'm sorry. Say it again. I said hello. It's Akaya. Akaya. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm from Arkansas. Arkansas. And I was going to tell a story. And ask a question. Okay. Okay. Um, y'all were talking about the night hag syndrome? Uh, you're a little broken up on us. Uh, the, the hag syndrome, yeah. Yes, sir. I had, uh, I've heard people say it's just sleep paralysis. But I don't think it is personally because my pastor woke up one night and there was some, a black figure on his chest. And it was choking him. This was your and, pastor? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Did, and, uh, did, I mean, did he say this in a sermon, or how did you get the information? <clears throat> he told me personally, we're, he's a friend of our family, and we've been going to his church for years. Okay. And um, he was telling us, because we were talking about different experiences we had had. And he said that one night he woke up, and this black thing was in his chest choking him and he couldn't breathe and he said all he could do was in his mind say Jesus help me uh-huh. and the thing let go Okay. and as uh, soon as he did he, I'm sorry what? I'm sorry Akai it's hard to continue because you're kind of breaking up on us a little bit but um, anyway he called upon his God and that cured it well it took off running out the door and it literally it hit part of the door and left a nick in the door where you can see it yikes <laughs> um okay like, okay well thank you very very much for the call so uh there is a bit of a physical manifestation for you david right and you know again we do hear those on occasion with these night hag incidents and enough so that we can't i don't think that we can dismiss all of those off as sleep paralysis there's just a there's a component of them there there's you know percentage of them that just have unexplainable elements like this you know piece of physical evidence essentially Right. You'd have to look at that all the time and remember the incident. Uh, going to Denver, Colorado on the phone. Hi. Hello. Going once, going twice, gone like the wind. Omaha, Nebraska. Hi. Hello there. Omaha, Nebraska. Well, no, I'm wrong. Chapel Hill in Chapel Hill something. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Adam. And uh, I'm an alien abductee, but I uh, have experienced old hag, OBEs, and I have a shadow person experience. You've had it all, huh? I I did, <clears throat> especially when I was under 10 years old. My my shadow person memory, well, it would happen. I was under seven years old, like five, six, seven, and every not every night, but it was it was always the same. A dark figure would come toward my bed and I, I would see it clearly so, sometimes more clearly than others sometimes I was so afraid it was very threatening it was very terrifying and it would go under the covers and then it would disappear but sometimes I felt more empowered and I would sort of stare at it and this one time it got closer and closer and it manifested more clearly and I could see it it was similar to what the other caller said it looked like I mean no distinct facial features. It was all dark and smoky and shadowy, but it looked like it was wearing a hood, and I even saw it look like it was carrying a big chain. Oh, God. That, Just so I'm clear, did you say it would go under the covers? I would go under the covers. Oh, you would? Get, well, that I get. I thought you said <laughs> it went under the covers. That's that's where you got to draw the line. <laughs> and it, yeah, not, but this was when I was wide awake. I knew I was w- awake. Before I'd fall asleep, I would see it, and it would come pretty much on a regular basis. And so what did you do? Well, I, 
at a certain age, around maybe eight or nine, I stopped seeing it. But as I when I got older, uh, I just it never harmed me. But I was always extremely terrified of it. And when I look back on it, I wonder since I'm an abductee, if that could be a screen memory for the visitors, the aliens. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, David, uh, is there any age-related part here? In other words, uh, an awful lot of these people remember this happening as a child. Yeah, and I noticed that tonight. It's it's very uh, curious, but across the board, when we look at these shadow people encounters, they're not really clustered around particular age groups or, uh, you know, race or ethnic background or anything else. They it, it really, across the board, it's a wide, wide variety of people of all ages and backgrounds that are experiencing these things. <laughs> and they seem to be on the increase, or people just want to talk about them more. I'm not sure what it is, but just everything is jammed with people... Robert, uh, on Skype, hello. Hey, how are you doing? Okay, how are you? Uh, 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 real quick, uh, Roswell, she, um, Okay, uh, are you on a speakerphone or something, Robert? No, I'm using my, uh, my palm thing here to Your try and talk to you. Palm thing? All right, you're going to have to talk right into it. How's this? A little better. Because uh, I can't get any closer to the mic, so... Okay, it's good. Uh, Go. All right, so my question for you is, um, so first off, Roswell, to you, and my dad got me interested in your show back in the late 90s in Peoria, mm-hmm. Illinois. Um, I'm glad you're back on, but my question is, um, I grew up having, like, a haunting thing going on at my house. My room was always, like, 10 degrees colder than the rest of the house, <sighs> and there was one night in particular where a demonic voice said, listen to me, follow me. And I looked up at my drapes in my bedroom, and this is back in, like, 1978. I was eight years old. And the, there was, like, a red glow on the drapes, but when you opened the drape up, you could just see the front yard on, out in front of you. And ever since then, we've, uh, we, I've had inter- weird things happening where, like, you're seeing, uh, pardon what I'm going to call it, but, like, black sperm, like, two feet above the floor, just always in the shadows, just like flipping around. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if that's like a precursor to like a shadow person, <clears throat> or what does that mean? Uh, you know what I mean. The best way I can describe that is like a scene in Ghost. I don't know. It's uh, it's it's almost like calling up uh, and asking for a doc a doctor for a diagnosis. And I and there's just give it a shot if you've got anything, David. Yeah, you know, like you're saying, Art, there are just so many factors to these individual experiences. It, it's really tough to to say much about that one. I, I mean, he's, you know, he's seen this red glow, which people have reported uh, seeing these things, uh, having glowing red eyes, and sometimes, you know, standing behind the curtains or something, and then they, you know, the eyes are visible through the curtains, and then they manifest out from behind that. Uh, you know, it, it's... That's about the only thing I can say about it. You know, it sounds like he's having elements of these shadow people, certainly in those situations. He mentioned temperature, um, and many, many times associated with some sort of, I don't know, apparition or whatever it is, the temperature seems to drop sharply. Um, Any idea what causes that, why the temperature changes? Well, again, something that there's a lot of theories about, but, um, you know, it, it's almost the reverse of if you think about a small room and you put a lot of people in that room, the temperature is going to go up. So if we sort of reverse that and think about whatever these things are, yes. they seem to have the opposite effect. When they come in a room, they make the temperature go down. So uh, I, I don't have an explanation for it. I, I think it's important data. It's one of the questions I always ask people, actually, when they have these shadow people encounters, if they noticed any shift in the temperature or any signs, you know, uh, with their own bodies, you know, the hair standing up or, or feeling a chill and things like that. And very, very often that is the case, that they feel things like that happen. You know, in, in my case, I was so damn scared, I'm being honest here, that I don't think I would have noticed a 10-degree temperature drop at all. Um, right. All right, 
uh, next, uh, whoever that would be. It looks like Omaha, Nebraska. Yes, sir. Hi, David. Um, can you hear me? Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Um, I had an experience in 2010 with a very large uh, female black figure in my room over my bed. Mm-hmm. And she had, she was holding a black cube. And, you know, and I've, and I've thought about the the sleep paralysis factor with this. She was blowing on the cube, smiling, like she was very jovial, very happy. And she was blowing on this cube, and it was dissolving in the air, and it was going into my nostrils. I mm. could not breathe. I was basically inhaling through the whole experience. The reason I called was a couple of things that you had brought up. The thing that snapped me out of it was a, a lightning strike in the back of my yard, and then I could inhale, and, and she was gone. Wow! I read your bio, I read your bio um, that you had a, a shamanic background, and I actually contacted a shaman in Omaha and brought this up. His first question was, "Did it have red eyes?" and and I couldn't say yes because she did not. But through that experience, um, this, is, this, is so, this is so personal. Um, I had a family member that had OD'd that night. Oh, my. Um, and commit, committed suicide. So that relates to kind of what you were saying, too, with death. Um, through the experience, by going to the practitioner, I actually witnessed this person crossing over I can't really say that listen caller we're running out of time the, the show is ending of course I understand I understand I understand Art thanks for having that, me on you're love, very welcome love back. thank you uh, yeah I can't control the time I'm sorry so David uh, the show is ending <laughs> uh, <laughs> too soon just everything is jammed thank you so much for being here and scaring the hell out of me